Hello everybody, welcome to the channel. So today we are talking about Unit 4 Biology Area Study 2, um, focusing on this top point here, biological knowledge and society. So in terms of looking at biological knowledge and society, the main dot points that are part of the 2020 study design um, are techniques that apply to DNA knowledge in terms of gene cloning um, and talking about the social and ethical implications of um, gene cloning. The distinction between genetically modified organisms, so GMOs, and transgenic organisms, and their use in agriculture, um, and the biological, social, and ethical implications that can be raised for their use. Um, and we're also going to be looking at the emergence of new diseases, so looking at epidemics and pandemics, um, and looking at how to identify pathogens and the types of treatments for those pathogens. Now, whatever is in red is part of um, what the study design initially used to be, but obviously given our circumstances this year, um, those things have been removed. Okay, so looking at gene cloning, remember cloning is making copies. So when we're looking at cloning, we're looking at copies of genes. So this is looking at recombinant um, plasmids that we looked at in the last video. So in terms of recombinant plasmids, we have a gene of interest that we remove out of one cell. We place it into a plasmid cloning vector, okay? Um, and then we are now able to replicate and see whether the plasmid had been taken up. Um, we can identify which of our bacteria have been transformed um, in comparison to a bacteria that did not take up the plasmid. So in terms of pros and cons of this process, obviously there's positives and negatives to both. So in terms of our pros, the main ones that we're looking at is we're able to improve our food products, um, such as our fruits and vegetables. Um, so foods that were at once upon a time prone to pest um, infestations that can be relieved um, because of recombinant DNA technology or genetic modification. So we've been able to create crops that are more resistant um, to that pet infestation. We can create um, things that have a longer shelf life, higher nutritional content than our normal crop. Um, our crop yields and our crop quality have also greatly increased. Um, it is gonna be more cost effective um, in terms of looking at vaccines. We can look at only our desired antigen um, instead of the entire pathogen being used as well. Um, scientists made artificial human insulin with the help of recombinant DNA technology, and animal insulin is not a suitable replacement. So we're able to modify things for our own um, benefit. In terms of the cons, the majority of downsides um, are seen using recombinant DNA um, and organisms is considered unethical. Okay, So how much are we going to intervene in other things. Many people also believe that using recombinant DNA will go against the law of nature. So again, human intervention. Um, also looking at gene pollution to the environment, causing superweeds and creating antibiotic resistant microbes. We know that once things are um, resistant to antibiotics, it does become a lot harder to treat those bacterial infections. Um, a lot of the issues against these are also based on yeah, social aspect on what people will think. All right, moving on to the next part. So looking at GMOs and transgenic organisms. Now, when you think of GMOs, okay, genetically modified organisms, we're talking about any organism that has its genes modified. Okay, so modified means changed or altered in any way. So I want us to think of GMOs as our umbrella heading. And I want you to think of transgenic organisms as a type of GMO. So all transgenic organisms are GMOs, but not all GMOs are transgenic organisms. Okay, so in terms of thinking about GMOs, they are organisms whose genomes, okay, so all the DNA or the genes have been altered using genetic engineering technology. So they have gene combinations that do not occur naturally within the population. So the way that we can alter these genes, okay, is we can add 
a gene or DNA segments. We can silence genes so that they are no longer functioning. Um, but when we do this, the gene must be a heritable gene, so it must be able to be passed on to the next generation. Um, in terms of understanding the difference between GMO and transgenic organisms, in GMOs, the addition of a gene that we are talking about is coming from the same species. Okay, so it's not a different animal, it's the same. So in terms of examples, GMOs are often used in agriculture where foreign genes for insects and virus resistances um, are able to increase crop yield and value. So things like cotton, maize, potato, canola and rice. So canola um, can be modified against being affected by pesticides. Um, and animals, so Atlantic salmon, they've been engineered with growth hormones, um, but they're unable now to breed with wild populations of salmon. Um, but in terms of a pro, this is able to increase the value and the yield for salmon farming. In terms of transgenic organisms, now again, they are a type of GMO, so they've had their DNA altered, but the way that it's altered is that we are adding genes from another species. So we have one species of animal and we're taking something from something else and inserting it into that. So um, some examples are transgenic mice, which are used in research of human diseases. They can be achieved by micro-injecting DNA into fertilised eggs, or we can modify the embryonic stem cells. Um, there's also transgenic plants that can be created by physical uptake of DNA, um, but also agrobacteria-mediated uptake of DNA. So again, we are changing the DNA or adding DNA from other things. Um, an example that I love is the glowfish. So the glowfish are basically transgenic organisms because the glow um, colour has been taken from a particular jellyfish, inserted into a fish, which has now um, allowed these fish to glow. In terms of ethical issues, okay, a lot of people, again, social implications wise, think that GMOs need to be labelled because they think it may be unnatural, um, it's going against the norm. Um, so this can raise a lot of issues. Um, and there is also the risk of us sort of interfering and things being unnatural. Um, we also look at a reduction in diversity of the gene pool. If we start altering things for how we want things to be, um, that is gonna lessen our gene pool as well. All right, moving on to the next bit. Alrighty, so our next main subheading that we talk about in this part of the study design is looking at epidemics and pandemics. Now we know that this is obviously given COVID and everything going on very, very, very current. Okay, so we need to be able to explain or understand the difference between an epidemic and a pandemic. So an epidemic is basically the widespread of occurrence of an infectious disease in a community but it is restricted to a particular geographic area and it's at a particular time. Okay, so an outbreak of a disease or illness that spreads rapidly, but it is still localized to a restricted area. So the occurrence of more cases of a disease than expected in a region within a period of time. So some examples of epidemics that have occurred in the past, we've got SARS, cholera, Ebola, and yellow fever. Now, pandemics, hopefully you guys are a little bit more familiar with this, given our current global situation. Um, but a pandemic is a global outbreak of a disease, okay? So no matter where you live, it can still affect you. So the worldwide spread of a new disease. So an outbreak of a disease that occurs over a wide geographic area and it affects a high proportion of the population. So it doesn't discriminate. Um, it does not refer to the severity of the disease. It only refers to the spread of that disease. So a pandemic is such because the spread of a disease is greater. So for a pandemic to start, there are a few conditions that need to be met. So number one, a new pathogen or a new strain of an existing pathogen um, that nobody has immunity for. So there are no vaccines that exist for it and there is no means of prevention. So we can't help um, what the situation is until it arises. 
So the pathogen will then cause illness in people um, and often the pathogen can also infect other hosts besides people. Uh, there is easy transmission, so either by airborne particles, bodily fluids or vectors. So thinking about COVID as an example, we know that again we're wearing masks because um, the particles can spread quite easily um, and the spread occurs over a wide geographic area. So we can see that just from starting in a localised point, how global um, this virus has been able to spread through people. Um, so some examples in the past were mutagens of influenza A, uh, the Spanish flu, the Asian flu, the Hong Kong, Hong Kong flu, um, HIV AIDS in 1981, the Zika virus in 2016, and of course coronavirus, which we are currently looking at. Okay, and finally, we are looking at pathogens and treatments. So in our immunology unit, we looked at pathogens, um, pathogens such as bacteria and viruses. Um, now we are looking at those two and focusing in on them a little bit more. So in terms of treatment, antibiotics, when you go to the doctor, if you have a bacterial infection, they'll often give you antibiotics. They are used to treat bacteria infections only. Antibiotics have no effect on a virus. So antibiotics are basically substances that are produced by microorganisms, okay, by chemical synthesis, that in low concentration, they're able to inhibit the growth or kill microorganisms. So they're able to kill bacteria. So a class of antimicrobial drugs that are used in the treatment of prevention of bacterial infections, there's two main types or categories that we can split them into. Um, some with a narrow spectrum, so they act against a limited variety of microbes and some that are a broad spectrum. So they act on many different kinds of microbes. So some examples of antibiotics that you may have heard of are ampicillin or penicillin. Um, antivirals are used to treat viral infections. Okay, So antiviral drugs are um, examples of treatments for those living with HIV, um, protease inhibition, nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, integrase inhibitors and entry inhibitors are all examples of antivirals. Um, it's a type of medication, like I said, that's used for treating those viral infections or if you're infected with a virus. So they're only going to be effective when the viruses are located within host cells and are undergoing replication. So they, as we know, um, with viruses, they need a host to survive. Um, so they're only going to be effective if they're in a host, basically. The development of antiviral drugs can be difficult because the viruses are using host cells to replicate. So we need to ensure that when these antivirals are being created, that they are harming the viral cells, okay, and not the host cells. That is it in terms of these dot points of the study design. If you have any questions, please leave a comment below. Would love if you could subscribe, give this video a thumbs up and share with any other biology students. All right, have a good day. Bye.